welcome everyone who is attending our webinar today on the topic of understanding ISO standards, ISO 14644 Part 2, 2015, Clean Room Monitoring. The presentation will begin shortly, but there are some administration items I'd like to go over. First, to introduce myself, my name is Eric Gottlieb, and I'm the America's Business Manager for the Life Sciences Division of Particle Measuring Systems, and I'll be the moderator for today's presentation. If there are questions during the seminar, please ask them as the presentation proceeds, and we'll summarize the questions at the end of the seminar and answer them. If we run out of time to answer all of the questions, any questions not covered will be addressed separately, as well as posted on our website if we feel the broader audience will benefit from the information. Questions can be asked using the question section of the control screen on the webinar. If anyone is having any trouble with the audio or video, please use the raise your hand function and we'll try to address it as quickly as possible. There are four attachments related to today's presentation that can be downloaded at your convenience from the control screen during the presentation. These include a certificate of attendance, a summary of ISO 14644 Part 1, 2015, a summary of ISO 14644 Part 2, 2015, and our beginner's guide to particles. Now to introduce our presenter, Daniele Pandolfi. Daniele Pandolfi is our global product line manager for aerosol products in particle measuring systems life sciences division. He has over 10 years of experience in particle counter instrumentation and clean room contamination control, building close customer relationships, working with the customers to help solve their GMP issues. Daniele is also a featured speaker at the upcoming Interfex trade show in New York on the topic of ISO 14644 2015 revision. I will now be turning the webinar over to Daniele to present on the ISO 14644 Part 2 Revision Summary. Thank you, Eric, and welcome again to everybody. Good morning. So, let's immediately start for the today's presentation with the title of Understanding ISO 14644-2-2015. Here's the agenda of the today's presentation. We will have a short introduction about the ISO standard, some uh, information about the monitoring plan alternatives that are recommended by the ISO 14644-2, some tips and tricks to correctly set up your monitoring system in your clean room, and a specific talking about the risk assessment, which is a very important part of this new standard. Then we will go through the understanding of how to set up alert and action leave it, and which are the strategy that the standards suggest. At the end of the presentation, I want to share with you some FDA 483 warning letter that we feel are a beneficial tool to understand what the auditors, inspector, and what the standard is requiring to you in order to be compliant. The ISO 14644 has been recently, or maybe not anymore really recently because it was uh, released in, at the end of 2015, and introduced some uh, changes in the guidelines. Some uh, brief information about uh, the ISO community that voted in favor of this new standard in October the 29th, 2015. And it will, we will discuss the changes of the standard in this presentation. As my colleague Eric said, feel free to ask your question using the chat, the question and answer function, anytime they will come in mind. What is the ISO 14644? This standard includes a list of specific documents which provide standards, recommendations, requirements, and guidelines about the best approach to use in order to keep your clean room under control from a particle contamination point of view. We will touch today the part two, which is specifically related to the monitoring. Monitoring is a different activities when compared with the classification. Classification is an activity that has to be done 
uh, when the clear room is built and on a regular base, normally every one here, and the monitoring is a different activity that has to be done more frequently, and we will see how frequent has to be done, and must be used to provide uh, the evidence that your clean room is performing correctly and as expected. Other parts describe the test method of other equipment in the clean room, for example, the HVAC system, how to test the HEPA filter, as well as the part four, which uh, specifically talk about the design and construction and startup. Part eight, nine, and 10 are dedicated to the control of the surfaces in your clean room. Again, this standard provides a lot of guidelines for correctly perform your process and your production in the clean room under a controlled environment. As we know, the ISO 14644 represents one of the most used standards in electronic and pharmaceutical industries, probably the most used standard. The ISO 14644-2 specifies the requirement for a monitoring plan. The data obtained uh, provide the evidence of clean room performance, and any activities related to the monitoring plan must be based on a risk assessment. You will listen this word, risk assessment, many times during this presentation, because the latest ISO revision make a strong emphasization of this word and the meaning of the risk assessment. The, re the latest revision uh, emphasize also the need of having a strong monitoring strategy in addition to the initial or periodic execution, which is normally called classification. So make sure you have a rational and a defendable monitoring plan. Which, are, which was the main goal of the ISO Technical Commit 209, which is the technical commit taking care of the 14644 uh, standard when they started revisioning this standard. First of all, they, their main goal was to emphasize the need of advantage, <coughs> the advantages of a planned clear room contamination monitoring, provide the method for correct particle contamination alarm <coughs> and warning limit setup based on a data trend. <clears throat> this is something I want to underline. Alarm and alert limits must not be based on the ISO 14644-1 limit table, but must be based on your specific data trend. Define the difference between a simple periodic control and a more in intensive and complex monitoring strategy. And at the end, but probably the most important point to keep in mind, enhance the installation and process knowledge in order to achieve a mature understanding of your process and be uh, able to uh, react to any possible unexpected clear room uh, contamination. In my personal opinion, the ISO 14644-2 should not be considered only a standard with which to comply, but this must really consider it as a beneficial tool to use in achieving a mature clean room control. Last but not least, this is another goal dictated by the Technical Commit 209 is that this standard may help you in concretely reduce the operation cost by preventing production loss. In other words, the, the understanding of your process and the capability to immediately react to possible uh, <coughs> unexpected contamination scenario can really help you, concretely help you in reducing production loss and consequently will be a cost saving for your company. Let's see which are the monitoring plan alternatives that the ISO standard allows. First of all, 
I want to spend uh, 30 seconds is analyzing the terminology and the word monitoring. The monitoring as per ISO requirement is an observation of the process made in accordance with specific method and able to provide a clear evidence of a clear room performance. The ISO standard provides three different monitoring alternatives, continuous, sequential, and periodic. And let's go through these three possible alternatives. The first one I want to analyze is the sequential monitoring plan. This is a, an unaccepted method for pharmaceutical industry simply because this system employs the use of very long tubing, sometimes even longer than 30 or 40 meters, and as you can easily understand, the use of this long tubing may really affect the particle loss in the tubing. For this reason, pharmaceutical industry are not allowed to use uh, this system because you normally go uh, evaluating the contamination of particle greater than one micron, for example, five micron in a grade A case, but is a well accepted method for semiconductor industry where the bigger uh, size of particle to be considered is normally around 0 0.3 or 0 0.5 micron. So in this case, the very small size of the particle and the very, very low weight of this particle allows the use of very long tubing because the particle loss at this size is almost negligible. So keep in mind that this method is not accepted in the pharmaceutical industry anymore. The second alternative is represented by the continuous monitoring plan. It's most probably the most efficient method to control your clean room is normally used in a very high uh, cleanless grade like ISO 5 and this provides a continuous flow of data by having a dedicated particle counter for each single sample location. Having a continuous flow of data, this, provide, this give you the ability to immediately evaluate unexpected contamination event. The third uh, allowed method is called periodic. It means a scheduled particle monitoring, for example, once per week, once per day, once per month. This is normally applied to class like ISO 7 or ISO 8, and we will see later some example. But what is important to keep in mind is that by using this periodic monitoring plan, you must define and clearly specify the frequency and the method of sampling. This must be clearly written in your SOP and pro procedure. The monitoring setup. On the base of any monitoring plan, you need to have a, a risk assessment and the correct setup of monitoring. First of all, you need to identify your critical location, your critical point, and understand the contamination source and their impact on the activities of the clean room, as well as the product and consequently the possible effect on the patients that will receive the pharmaceutical product. You must locate the most critical zone by a risk assessment and verify which is the closest position of the sampling probe, even called an isokinetic probe, to the critical point. The FDA regulation allows for one foot maximum distance from the critical zone. The drawing on the right represents a sphere, so when locating your sample probe, Keep in mind, uh, try to imagine that you have a sphere in front of you with the one foot radius and try to locate the sample probe as close as possible within this one foot distance. In some particular case, this may be impossible. If this is the case, your inspector 
will expect you to provide a strong and defendable rationale to prove that the best position that you select was the closest possible. Maybe not within one foot, but the closest possible due of the technical limitation or wall and other limitation that you may have in your filling zone and your, your clear room. Other checkbox that has to be marked up when, when defining your monitoring plan include the selection of your particle counter. We are talking about particle and we are talking about the particle contamination. The ISO 14644 simply approve the particle counter as an instrument to be used for controlling the particle. But this instrument must be compliant with specific requirements like the collection efficiency, the suitability to monitor the specific particle size because on the market we have a, a wide range of particle counter, each one with different uh, technical specification and maybe different specific size. Also, evaluate the position of the particle counter to allow an easy access for maintenance, repair, and calibration, and to be able to remove it from, from your clear room. And also evaluate the potential adverse impact of the sampling system on the process. For this reason, I want to emphasize the importance of the isokinetic probe. What is normally called a, a funnel? In, in our work, this simple funnel is a very simple uh, item, but is a very important because this helps you to harmonize the very high speed of the instrument sample flow with the laminar flow rate of your laminar cabinet or filling zone. In other words, this harmonizes the sampling flow rate to 0. 45 meters per second or 90 feet per minute, which is the standard laminar flow rate in your clean room. The most common flow rate used for monitoring activities is 1 CFM, 1 cubic feet foot per minute. But anyway, the ISO do not uh, state any limitation in using higher flow rate or lower flow rate particle counter for clear room monitoring. Still talking about the instrument selection, I want to uh, show one of the most important change of the ISO. The ISO 14644-1 and-2 now states the needs of using a calibrated particle counter as well as before, but now emphasize the needs of use a 21501-4 ISO compliant particle counter. The ISO 21501-4 is the unique standard available for the calibration of light scattering iron particle counter. Prior 2007, when the standard has been released, there were not existing standard for particle counter calibration. In other words, each particle counter manufacturer were able to provide, a to use a specific method, limits, tolerance, for calibrating their particle counter. This new, the use of this standard right now is an important step to a much more harmonized uh, instrument calibration. So different particle counter manufacturer will use the same method, the same limit, and will provide more comparable result among different particle counter. This is one of the first principles of the metrology and is really important to use 21501 compliant instrument. In some case, you may have older particle counter manufactured, manufactured prior 2007. In this case, the ISO still allowed you to eventually use this particle counter. But you must write the rationale of about why you are still using an old particle counter in, in the test report. 
So some uh, of my customer ask me, what can be the rationale why I'm still using uh, an old particle counter? By looking at the uh, ISO FDs, the draft of the standard, there were several country comments. And one of the main reasons that why this note has been reported is because it was practically impossible to require the worldwide market to replace an enormous fleet of particle counter from a day to another. So this note practically gives you some time to migrate to the new standard, to the new technology, but keeping in mind that this goal must be achieved in a shorter time possible. You are not required to do it tomorrow, but you must be able to provide the inspector the evidence that you are working on migrating to the new standard, not only updating your SOP, but also considering the replacement of your particle counter. Another frequently asked question is related to the tubing length. There are several uh, misunderstanding, I would say, about the use of, uh, of tubing in, uh, <coughs> for particle transportation. The ISO standard do not specifically state any maximum length. It say that the maximum length must be specified by the particle counter manufacturer, and is typically within one and two meter. Now, particle measuring system, according with our test and experience provide in all instrument user manual a maximum length of tubing to be two meter. For sure the rule is always valid. Shorter is better. But we can say that the two meter length, also considering five micron particle, uh, make the particle loss in the tubing almost negligible. Again, as I stated before, if you are going to monitor only particles smaller than one micron, you, you don't necessarily need to consider the limit of two meters. You may also use longer tubing, but make sure your particle counter will be able to manage from a flow rate point of view and pressure drop a longer tubing. How to choose the right monitoring plan? We, we saw that we have three alternatives, continuous, periodic, and sequential. Now, the new revision of the ISO removed the table with the recommended monitoring plan and do not specifically provide any links between the cleanness class and the recommended monitoring method. This means that it's up to the user to choose the most appropriate one based on the specific requirements and risk assessment. What is important to understand about this standard is that the ISO moved the responsibility of selecting limits, monitoring plan, and, and other stuff from the, let me say, aseptic and two generic pieces of paper, which is the standard, to the specific need of the manufacturing side where you are working on. Anyway, there are some other uh, documents, some other standards that you may use to correctly and reasonably set up your monitoring plan. Specifically for life science industry, you can have a look at the World Health Organization document titled Environmental Monitoring of Clean Room in Vaccine Manufacturing Facilities. This, is, this uh, standard sorry, has been issued in 2012 and includes some instruction to determining which is the best monitoring frequency. All of the suggestions may be uh, summarized in the following table, which provide the direct correlation between the, uh, in this case we have the EU GMP uh, Annex 1 class, cleanness class, uh, for example the grade A, grade B, and grade C and D, which can also link it to the ISO class and provide uh, a direct link between the monitoring plan alternatives and the class. For example, in a grade A, which can be uh, considered an ISO class 
4.8, the monitoring activities must be performed during the full duration of operation, during the entire filling operation. When I say entire filling operation, I also want to include, you have to include, the preparation of your clean room. If you need to change the batch setup or any machine setup, these activities will directly impact the contamination of the clean room you are preparing for filling. So the monitoring, maybe with different alert and action limit, but also the preparation must be included in the continuous monitoring activity. Grade B, normally surrounding grade A, must be monitored daily, as well as the grade C, uh, C which has to be monitored weekly, and the grade D is not required. I want to uh, invite you in um, deeply evaluate the importance of the grade D, we, we, or, or grade uh, or ISO uh, 9. Most of the time we consider this class as uh, the, the, the dirtiest one, which is true, and not really important. I want to correct anyone that is thinking something like that, because the grade D is probably one of the most important area of your clean room, because this represents the first barrier from the external environment, and this is the first barrier for microbial contamination as well as particle contamination. So, to be honest, I would correct these not required monitoring activities to a weekly monitoring activities or as maximum a monthly monitoring frequency. The risk assessment. We touched a little bit the risk assessment already, and I want to talk briefly about the meaning of the risk assessment. This is an essential part of any clear room management and clear room monitoring plan. It's essential uh, for implementing a compliant monitoring plan. The goal of the risk assessment and also the question you should ask yourself when developing a risk assessment are the following on the right side of the slides. So you need to understand your process, which are the critical areas and location to correctly select the sample location, which are the possible source of contamination, not only the human activities in the clean room, but also other, other elements or events that may compromise the clean room performance. Compromising the clean room performance, you will affect the product quality and as well as the patient, but you will also negatively, negatively affect the operation cost for your company. So a strong monitoring plan will help you reducing operation cost and the right risk assessment is at the base of understanding how to approach the monitoring of the clean room. Creating a risk assessment is not the easiest task you may want to, to achieve in the near future. You may refer to some useful document available. One of those is the ICH Q9, which provide probably the best guidelines for a proper risk assessment development. Another useful uh, resource is represented by the PDA, the Parental Drug Association, which has a, a technical report uh, number 13, which is titled Fundamental of the Environmental Monitoring Program. And this also uh, addressed the, meaning, the, mean, the needs of a meaningful, manageable, and defensible monitoring program. Other resources also recommended by the ISO are represented by the HACCP, which is normally applied to the food uh, manufacturing side, but also give you a lot of interest information about the correct way to set up uh, to create a risk assessment. As well, a risk assessment development may also require you to collaborate with external consultant, expert in this kind of activities. But I believe a good starting point will be 
by reading the document I'm listing now in this slide. A responsible understanding of the production process and installation performance hides in the prevention of unexpected auto-specification auto condition, and we already learned and talked about that. But also, which is something to be considered now and in the near future, can really support any power-saving activities or green power initiative. Many countries are strongly <coughs> looking on reducing uh, pollution in, the, in our environment. And this, this goal can be achieved by reducing the power that we use in the clean room. For example, uh, I can share with you experience where customer, by adding consistent amount of data, were able to determine the level of uh, uh, decreasing speed of the HVAC system during the weekend, for example, or during the night when the production wasn't active. So this really helped them, consistently helped them in reducing the power consumption in the company. Again, reduce the cost. Alert and action limit and how to choose the right strategy. As I said at the beginning, the alert and action limit must not be based on the ISO 14644-1 limit tables. This is a good starting point in case you are starting now monitoring your clean room and you don't have any uh, data trend, you don't have any container of data available at the moment, but you need to consider the development of alert and action limit based on the clean room performance. Over a certain period of time, this can be two, three months or even six months and you need to evaluate in a risk assessment, which are the uh, contamination events, what is related to each contamination level, and define which are the appropriate alert and action limit. Let's have a look at the difference between action and alert limit. Action level is a user set level, not the standard set level, but a user set level at which, when exceeded, will require immediate intervention, root cause investigation, and corrective action. A pharmaceutical company <coughs> uh, made an analysis a few years ago about the cost of uh, a deviation in a pharmaceutical industry. These activities may cost between 15 and 50,000 US dollars. So the prevention of deviation is another way to really and actively reduce the cost. The alert limit may help you to preventively identify possible risk scenario and provide early warning of a drift from normal condition. The right determination of action an alert limit is extremely important and must be supported by the risk assessment and a consistent quantity of historical data, as I said before going in deep detail of the alert and action limit definition. The ISO 14644-2 also states the importance of a long-term evaluation as well as a yearly assessment of limit, method, and frequency. Sometimes we, <clears throat> we do not consider the need of uh, reviewing and eventually change, modify <clears throat> the actual monitoring plan. So something that was developed five years ago may not be consistent with the actual activities. Something can be changed like the product we are producing, like the specific activities we are doing in the clear room. If this is the case, the monitoring plan must be revised. Sometime may not be really necessary to change anything, but you should always question yourself at least one per year, and this is 
dictated by the ISO, ISO standard, you should question yourself at least once per year asking, is my monitoring plan still consistent with my activity? Is there, is there anything I can do to enhance and improve the effectiveness of my monitoring plan? Inspectors and auditors will expect you to provide the evidence that your monitoring plan has been at least revised and controlled it once per year. I want you to <clears throat> having a deep look of this extract of the ISO standard. This is strictly related to the <clears throat> strategy of alert and action limit alarm. The paragraph B.3.1.3 states a very important thing. Frequent nuisance alarm should be avoided as they can lead to alarm being ignored by the user. <clears throat> this is something that may happen in any of your company. When an alarm is triggered every minute, the user may start to seriously ignore the alarm after a period of time. The ISO really want to discourage this to happen. And how to approach it? The standard provides two examples of a strategy. The first example <coughs> is uh, the, the alarm established a trigger uh, threshold value based on a series of consecutive high reading. For example, three consecutive reading out of specification, which is now represented by the red line, in three consecutive minutes. So these two single events are not considered alarm, are not triggering any alarm in, the ca in this case and using this strategy. The second strategy that we can see now on the screen adopts a different, um, a different method where, again, three out of specification reading in a specific time frame, which is in this case 10 minutes and is uh, normally a moving windows over the time, are generating an alarm. These two strategies can be applied, but it can also be slightly modified according with your specific uh, risk assessment, are only <clears throat> intended to be a recommendation, a suggestion to discourage when not strictly necessary, the, the consideration of single event are alarm. Again, to discourage that nuisance alarm will be present in your during your process and then maybe ignored by the user. We are almost arrived to the to the end of presentation, but I, I want you to have a look at this FDA 483 warning letter. As we know, being compliant with the with any standard required experience, knowledge, critical approach, and enabling the harmonization of regulation requirement with specific production environment is sometimes not very easy. <clears throat> also because your production environment is specific for your product and specific for your activities. The standard, as the words say, is a standard that has to be applied to many different scenarios. Jumping on this task uh, can be done well in advance by studying the observation of FDA inspector. FDA warning letter may also help you to understand what the inspector are looking for when auditing a, a, a pharmaceutical manufacturing. 483 letter are available on the FDA website, but I extracted a couple of those which are uh, reported in the Scott Shutton uh, document called the environmental monitoring program in a GMP environment. Here is the first one. This is an extracted of the letter and says 
regarding the increased non-runtime surveillance monitoring performance to further evaluate the building 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, manufacturing facility, there was no plan in place specified the location to be tested, the method of sampling, and action to be taken when microbial contamination was noted. It's not a mistake that I mentioned the microbial contamination in this presentation. ISO 14644 is related to the particle contamination, but the microbial monitoring is also very important activities and both of them are strictly related. It's an important activity for any clean room monitoring plan. This warning letter states the needs of having a monitoring plan in place, and we discuss about that, but also a clear description of the location, a clear indication of the critical zone that you identify, and specific sampling method. Monitoring results are considered insufficient if they don't support a link to a clear and approved plan. So everything you do, do not as a consistent value if it's not supported by an SOP and again a risk assessment that describe the rational why you choose specific performance um, method. The second letter I want to share with you states that the alert and action limit established for the manufacturing areas are not based on historical data taken from the environmental monitoring program. In this case, this customer didn't evaluate the historical data trend and most probably they were using the classification limits, which as I said are not consistent and should not be used for monitoring activities unless you are starting now to monitor your clean room and you need to have a, at least a, a starting base. This warning letter is quite old and was issued in 2001 and requires the clean room user to proactively and critically review the sampling historical data because they are a reference for correctly set up the appropriate alert and action limit. At that time, in 2001, the availability of software platform that may help you in a quickly and easily um, retrieve data trend was not probably so easy to be found on the market. But for sure, as we are now in 2017, there is no excuse for you to actively look at the market and check which are the possible software platform that you can use to easily collect your data and, and retrieve immediate data trend of clean room to understand if within a six months period your clean room is performing better or if the performance are going down. So as well for developing the right action, alert, and limit set point, which are also necessary to be evaluated on a year base to uh, question yourself about the consistencies of your monitoring plan year by year. As a conclusion, and then we will switch to the question and answer sh session, the ISO 14644-2 is not only a new standard to be compliant with, but is really is a beneficial tool to be used in, in order to achieve a mature clean room environmental control. This standard main goal, as I stated at the beginning, is to cultivate and promote a strong knowledge of a clean room performance inside every company and among any single clean room user. The ISO 14644-2 was published on December 15, 2015, and all users who want to be compliant with this standard are required to take any necessary action immediately. The reason why I say immediately is because the new standard practically delete and replace 
the old ISO 14644, 1999. If you even try to go to the www.iso.org website and you try looking for the old version of standard, you will get a web page that states the, old, the 1999 standard has been deleted and is replaced by the 2015 standard. So practically is not anymore available unless we have a copy on our desk. But this is not anymore a standard to use. So inspector normally allowed what we call a period of grace, which can be six to 12 months. And to be honest, we are already out of this time. But anyway, any auditors that will come to your company to verify the status of compliance will require you to at least prove any activities that is supporting the migration to the new standard. So keep in mind that you need to concretely prove you are moving to the next standard. Okay, that's all for the presentation and we are now at the question and answer session and I switch again to my colleagues Eric that collected the question during the presentation. Thank you, Daniele. There were many questions during the presentation. The first one is, can I omit the annual clean room classification required by the ISO 14644 part one if I run continuous monitoring? Uh, no, the, the clean room monitoring cannot replace the classification uh, that is performed on an annual or semi-annual base. The classification uh, process, which is dictated by the ISO 14644 part one must be performed in combination with uh, other equipment tests, uh, for example, the HVAC system test, which are described in the ISO 14644 part three. Thank you. The, the next question is, which particle sizes should I be monitoring in my clean room? This is something to be, to be determined uh, by the risk assessment. Normally, in a pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing clean room, the particle size to be monitored are 0 0.5 and 5 micron. Next question is, the ISO 14644 part one removed the requirement to count 5 micron particles for ISO class 5 clean rooms. What about monitoring in those clean rooms? For monitoring activities, this is something uh, uh, still required. And a risk assessment analysis as well is required to support the selection of specific particle size. But normally in the monitoring activities, it is required to monitor the fine micron as well in pharma industry again. Thank you. The next question is, does the ISO 14644 part two also apply to microbial monitoring? No, not, not specifically. Do not specifically talk about microbial contamination, but only about particle. The, anyway, the, the microbial contamination is something to be, to be controlled. Uh, and you can find some details um, in the EU GMP Annex 1, FDA current GMP, and also in the ISO 14698, which specifically talk about the microbial um, control. Thank you. The next question is, what is the right height to place the sample probe? So we, we, um, we see in the slide that the position is uh, within one foot from the critical zone. And the, the height, for sure, uh, must be in proximity or equal to the work height. So particle samples should never be done just under the filter unless we are making a, a filter scanning. So the height must be at the working height. So. OK, thank you. Well, another question is, which parameters other than particles should be monitored in the clean rooms? Again, 
this must be evaluated uh, according with the with the risk assessment and which parameter may affect the quality of your product. The the ISO 14644 has a list of other parameters, but this list do not limit the monitoring of other factor in the clean room, like for example temperature, differential pressure, humidity, and ventilation performances. But this is only a short list. Uh, you may also consider other parameters specifically uh, dangerous for your product. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, does 21 CFR Part 11 apply to the ISO monitoring requirements? This is an interesting question because ISO 14644 do not specifically talk about the CFR 21 Part 11, but considering the monitoring activities, an active part, an active, um, um, <clears throat> an active part of the batch release, the data collected by any monitoring system or produced by any software must be in respect of the data integrity good practice, which can be directly related to the CFR 21 Part 11 standard. So, short question would be yes. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have is, how many samples should I take in order to develop my alarm limits? Uh, it's not really a matter of, uh, of number of samples, but uh, I would limit it, it to, the, the, uh, to the time. It, it's recommended to define the alert and action limit based on a consistent amount of data. Typically, uh, a good amount of data can be retrieved at, after four, five, or six months of trend. Thank you. Uh, the next one is, which particle value should I get from my instrument? Should I be using the cumulative or the differential values? Okay, this is something uh, which is valid for any standard, not only the ISO, but also the EU GMP. So, the limit provided in the ISO standard are always related to cumulative count in a specific amount of iron, specific volume. Differential value can be uh, successfully used to, to perform troubleshooting activities and deeply understand the source of contamination. But to be uh, compliant with the, with the standard, always look for the cumulative count. Okay, thanks. The next question is, if the particle counter cannot be located right near the sampling location, can I use stainless steel tubing to connect the sample location to the particle counter? Oh yes, stainless steel, uh, I would say 316L stainless steel can be absolutely used and is one of the best material that you can use. There is also other alternative, uh, we can say plastic, alter plastic alternative which are represented by beveline tubing, tigon, tu tigon tubing and other polyurethane tubing. It's important that you select the right tubing and I strongly recommend you to contact the particle counter manufacturer to select the right tubing, not only from a material point of view, but also from a size point of view. The size must be the correct one according with the specific particle counter you are, you are using. Thank you. <coughs> The, the next question is actually uh, about the ISO 21501 Part 4, and the question is, where can we find the difference between the ISO 21501, uh, sorry, the ISO 21501 Part 4 standard for calibration of particle counters and older ISO standards for calibration of particle counters? Interesting question because there is no answer to this question, <laughs> simply because uh, uh, before the introduction of ISO 21501-4, which was in 2007, no ISO standards were existing for particle counter calibration. And any manufacturer were using its own procedure and method. For sure, limiting the harmonization and repeatability of measurement among different particle counters. So, 
there were there is no an answer to that because there were no standards existing at that prior to the ISO 21501. Okay, thank you. The next question is is the allowed distance from the critical point to the particle counter valid for all types of particle counter or just for one cubic foot per minute particle counters? In most of the case, this is valid for uh, any flow rate you will use, but uh, I recommend to check on the particle counter user manual or technical specification provided by the manufacturer which is the recommended maximum length for your specific instrument model. Thank you. The next question asks, if the grade A area is in operation for two hours, would you monitor that area continuously and then the surrounding grade B area immediately after operation to cover the daily requirement? Yeah, this, this is a right approach, uh, but the grade B may be even sampled just prior the filling to verify that the cleanliness of the area is, uh, uh, is suitable for the incoming uh, filling operation. Thank you. The, the next question is, what is your recommendation for a monitoring sampling approach a full cubic meter or a series of one minute samples? Oh, for sure I recommend the use of a one minute series of sample because this method will provide you a better, let's say, real time vision of any unexpected event. If by sampling a, a wall cubic meter, you will only get the result at the end of the sample and you will not immediately understand when an unexpected contamination event occurred. Thanks. The, the next question is a good one. Actually, I've, I've seen it asked quite often. The question is, what if you are just starting up your process and you don't have any historical data to use in order to set proper alert and action limits? Yeah, as I, as I say, this is a this is something that may happen. In this case, a good reference are the limits dictated by the ISO 14644-1. So you may start using that and, and begin create your data trend as soon as possible. Thanks. The next question is, does the monitoring sample location relate to the classification sampling plan in the ISO 14644 part one, for example, the same sample positions, or should it be entirely different? This is most of the time difference. You, sh you don't need to replicate the same sample location that you use for classification. And most of the time, the location you will use for monitoring activities will be less than a half of the classification number or lo location number. The selection of monitoring sample location, again, must be supported by uh, the risk assessment. And you don't necessarily need to do exactly the same that it does in, in the classification activity. All right, thank you for that. The next question is, how often is it necessary to verify and calibrate the particle counters used for monitoring? once per year or less. And this is a requirement that is uh, clearly uh, reported in the ISO 21501-4. The calibration must be done once per year or less. Thanks. The, the next question is, should the fan or motor system in a clean filtered laminar flow cabinet be turned on for some time period well before the cabinet is used to dispense pharmaceuticals or do other processing. Absolutely, this is a this is a normal practice to to ensure that the flow cabinet uh, or or any other filling machine is in the right cleanliness condition before starting the production. I I also want to suggest uh, 
uh, the the evaluation of the recovery time and the uh, 14644 part 3 uh, provides specific guidelines to correctly define the recovery time. In this way, you can, uh, you can understand how many minutes or hours you need to run this, this fund prior starting the, the production or any activities you have to do. All right. Thank you, Daniele, and thank you, everyone. We are out of time. We did receive a lot of additional questions, uh, which we haven't had enough time to answer. Um, but I would like to thank everyone for attending today. If you did ask a question and we were not able to answer this, we'll be following up uh, directly with you. Um, also, we will be providing uh, all of the questions that were asked and the answers to everyone. So if you have any additional questions, please feel free to email Particle Measuring Systems at any time for assistance. In addition, this presentation, the downloads, and the questions will be available on our website as well within 48 hours for download. Thank you for attending our webinar today, and please look forward to future webinars that we offer on topics of interest in cleanroom contamination monitoring and sterility assurance. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody.